we are here today to talk about our two journals um, from the Art Institute of Chicago and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I think we're gonna jump right into the next slide. And we want to acknowledge the land that both of our museums rest on. So the Art Institute of Chicago is located on the traditional unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi nations. Many other tribes, such as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, and Fox also called this area home. The region has long been a center for indigenous people to gather, trade, and maintain kinship ties. Today, one of the largest urban American Indian communities in the United States resides in Chicago. Members of this community continue to contribute to the life of this city and to celebrate their heritage, practice tradition, and care for the land and waterways. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and the land acknowledgement from the Metropolitan Museum of Art is, um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is situated in Lenape Hoking, homeland of the Lenape diaspora, and historically a gathering and trading place for many diverse native peoples who continue to live and work on this land. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities, past, present, and future for their ongoing and fundamental relationships to the region. So now on to us and our projects. So I am, my name is Lauren Macomb. I'm the Associate Director of Production and Manager of Digital Initiatives at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I am a 30 something white woman wearing my hair back and round earrings, sitting in a room with some very funny art on the wall. Um, and my colleague from the Art Institute is Ilya Moskvin, who is our a senior developer on the Art Institute's engineering team. Ilya. Um, hi, uh, I'm Ilya. Uh, my voice sounds like this. I am a late 20 something uh, white guy wearing a black t shirt and black glasses. Thank you, Ilya. And our project is the Art Institute Review, which is a new journal. It is a peer reviewed online only journal that spurs collaborative interdisciplinary dialogue and embraces art's radical potential to help us understand culture, history, and our current moment. We are looking very much forward to watching this soon, but it will be published, published twice a year in the fall and in the spring. And each issue contains six to eight articles, interviews, and creative contributions. And each issue will be guided by a, a team of two, one member of the Art Institute and one member of not the Art Institute. Um, originally, this journal was intended to, to provide us with a vehicle for publishing curatorial content and non-curatorial content that um, concerned the museum as a whole. And so we invite anyone from the museum to propose an issue theme and a co-editor to help um, edit that, that particular issue with them. And then we generate the contributions through an open call for papers that goes out twice a year. We are looking forward to, to publishing this soon and um, integrating it into our larger digital publishing ecosystem. We have many digital publications, long form book-like publications on our website, and we also have a blog. I will give, hand it over to Ilya to talk about the platform that this is built with. Uh, yeah, so one of the, uh, from technical side, I think one of the, um, long-term strategic decisions that we made was to integrate this platform uh, into our main website. So, you know, using the CMS, the front end, adapting it. Um, for anyone curious, our website is built with PHP using the Laravel framework and the tool CMS. Um, because the, uh, well, the first issue of this publication launches on October 25th, so we do not have a link handy yet, but if we advance the slide for a moment, um, we thought we would show you a quick preview of what it looks like. Um, 
there is the detail page on the left uh, with some uh, of the more graphic uh, and, and interactive content that we'll have uh, in the publications, um, uh, example of an image slider. Um, and then we also have a, a landing page for the issue on the right, just as a quick preview. Uh, once the publication launches, we will share it in the MCN Slack. Um, I will pass it on to the med team. Thanks, Ilya and Lauren. Um, so yeah, as you guys can tell, we're going to go back and forth a little bit between um, the Met and the AIC. We're introducing um, our different publications right now. Um, but firstly, I'm Sophie Anderson. I head up the digital content and editorial team here at the Met. Um, and I'm a middle-aged uh, white woman with shoulder length hair, salt and pepper. Um, and I go by the pronouns she, her. And I'm here at the offices of the Met today with a whiteboard and some actual physical books uh, behind me, some art books. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about our perspectives um, initiative. So about a year ago, last month, we launched uh, the MVP of Perspectives, which is a new online magazine and ecosystem of content. Um, our launch was the culmination of a holistic rethink of the Met's digital channels that I've been working on with the team um, since my arrival about two and a half years ago um, at the Met where we've really been um, reconsidering what we make, how we make it, and most importantly, who we make it for. Um, our approach has been guided by thinking about our audiences first. Uh, we took our existing blog program, which is geared towards getting really as many articles out in the world as possible, to asking what do people want to read about and how can we sustainably publish at scale and connect our programs, our research, our ideas to the things that matter to the people out in the world. Um, our, our current audiences and our prospective audiences. And we essentially needed a strong editorial strategy where each piece of content has a purpose and an audience. And we also wanted to decenter authority by inviting outside voices in. Um, we'll be focusing on perspectives today, but I just wanted to mention this part of a much larger content um, and product strategy across the website. Um, where we're doing a lot of um, various different kind of publishing models, including inviting um, curatorial and other departments to self-author on other parts of the website. I'm really pleased to be joined today by my colleagues, um, our executive producer, Sarah Wombold, um, our um, product designer, Matt of Tanka, and our producer editor, Will Fenstermacher, who will each be uh, talking about different aspects of this project. And I'm gonna be turning it over now to Sarah to really talk about how the importance of this project um, really came to the fore during the pandemic. Um, and over to you now, Sarah. Great, thanks, Sophie. Uh, I'm Sarah Wombold. Um, as Sophie mentioned, I'm an executive producer at The Met. Uh, I am a 40-something-year-old white woman with brown hair and bangs, and I am sitting uh, in my bedroom in Denver, Colorado. Um, so we were talking as a group um, AIC and the Met about these projects that we were publishing, and we wanted to put them into a bit of context. Uh, obviously, the past 18 months has presented unprecedented hardships, both personally and professionally. But interestingly, uh, with museums closed for a substantial period of time, never before have we had the opportunity to study the behaviors of our online only, only audiences in this kind of isolated manner. Um, this graph is from a, a recent research study conducted by digital strategists uh, Marty Spellerberg and Grace Poole. Um, Marty and Grace were looking to understand the impact of museum closures on website traffic. Uh, the y-axis here shows performance by session compared to the previous year. So above 100% is more sessions than the previous year. Below 100% is fewer sessions than the previous year. The dotted line is the average of all of the museums in the study. So I, I don't know if you can see my cursor rolling around here, but museum closures uh, uh, started nationwide at the end of week 11. So right about here. Um, and you can see an orange line and a yellow line kind of continue on an upward trend, despite the fact that those closures happened right about there. Um, those two lines are the Met and Art 21, um, which is interesting because both institutions um, have a lot of brand equity built up in kind of evergreen content. Um, the Getty is this other line that you see with a fast kind of recovery. Uh, you might remember that Getty pivoted to their recreate art from home social media challenge at about week 13, which is what that slope up 
is. Um, and a little more context. Um, last year, Sliver Lynette and LaPlaca Cohen released their culture check report, which many of you have probably read. Among their findings, they concluded that digital only users are more likely to be more diverse. So it's really within this um, context that we wanted to talk about publishing long form content, evergreen content on our websites, as opposed to exhibition focused content or more ephemeral types of content. So the way that we're gonna continue this presentation is that we're gonna keep going back and forth between our two institutions and our two projects. And we wanted to address these three high level um, points. So first we are gonna talk about our audiences, who we built this for. So that this will really encompass a lot of the kind of groundwork that led us to where we wanted to be with these projects. The second is process and sustainability. We really wanted to talk about the nature of our collaborations, what we built, how we built it, and why. And then third is traffic and engagement. And this really mostly concerns planning for the future. This last section will be a little bit different between the Met and the Art Institute since the Met's project has launched and they have some data and information to share about what they've done since launch and the Art Institute uh, we plan to launch on the 25th. So we have some plans for the future nevertheless, but um, the, the different presentations will, will diverge at points, but we'll come together at the end for some broad level recommendations that we have. So jumping right into audiences for the Art Institute. So I wanted to mention upfront the digital catalog study from 2019. So in 2019, the Art Institute collaborated with the Getty, the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the National Gallery in Washington, DC to study digital catalogs in museums. Following the study, we founded the Museum Publishing Digital Interest Group or MUPUDIG. And I need to shout out there um, to the Mupu Dig Slack where Ilya, Sarah, and I first conceived of this particular presentation. I invite you to go to digpub digpublishing.github.io um, if you want to learn more about Mupu Dig. But here are some of the main things that came out of that study that really informed the way that we want our journal. So the first thing that was most important to understand was whether or not people were really using these type of long form scholarly publications that museums produced. And that was where we had this resounding and very happy response that yes, the catalogs are attracting a large and diverse user base. So this really gave us the, the backing that we wanted to launch into this project that was going to take up a ton of staff time. Um, and uh, a lot of, of effort in creating a new stream of publishing at our museum. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we went into it in the smartest way possible. So we thought about how digital tools were being used and how people were coming to these types of, of publications. So one of the main things that we learned was that navigation was incredibly important. So many users do not enter the catalogs through their home pages, and the structures of digital catalogs are complex. So users needed clear signals to help them navigate. And links between the catalogs and the parent museum website are valued, but also require indicators to tell users when they're in the catalog and when they've left. This was what started us down the road of really wanting to use our own website as the platform for our digital publishing going forward. And it solved a lot of the shortcomings that this study and just our knowledge of our old platform um, uh, identified. So the OSCE shortcomings that we were looking to move away from were that it's unfriendly. It does not do well with PDFs. It was siloed away from our parent website and it was generally inaccessible. It didn't have a lot of, of tools to, to bring us up to where we wanted to be with WCAG standards and whatnot. So our aims were mobile friendly, accessible, integrated into our website so that you can move in and out of it and understand that you were in a publication, but that it related to our broader website and content. 
and to leave behind some outdated features and design. So over on the on the perspective side, um, similarly, it was really key for us to ground our work in thinking about our audiences. And as I mentioned earlier, this was connected to kind of a larger uh, rethink of the website as a whole. And as part of that, we developed three archetypes, uh, which are here on the slide. Um, essentially, we've got archetypes um, on the inner circle. It's kind of like an onion. And on the outside, we've got their motivations. So um, if you can see on the inside, we've got casual browsers with their motivations being curiosity or being curious. Art enthusiasts on the inner um, inner circle being engaged and professionals being informed. And looking at our website as a whole, we really felt that there was an opportunity to reach more of the curious and engaged audiences and that other parts of our website would serve um, the professionals audience. And this was um, really a big um, shift for us, um, in addition to the kind of editorial approach, really thinking about um, discoverability and connections across the site as one of the um, the biggest potential opportunities. So bringing people in through um, editorial content, whether it be articles or uh, video, and then they're kind of onward journeys to, to more content. Um, onto the, on the next slide, really we, from there we thought about um, this kind of key part of our problem in addition to what I mentioned earlier being what kind of content we're creating. Really, we were finding that people would come to the website, they'd get a blog, they would, you know, they would get a, a newsletter with the blog, they would come to the website, they would read the blog, but then they wouldn't explore anything further. There were no um, onward journeys. So people wouldn't sort of discover the range of content uh, or connections to larger themes and potentially kind of progress on from being curious to engaged. Um, so some of the things that stood in our way, we have old systems, they were not integrated, they were not intended for onward journeys. So again, lots of people coming, and then leaving. And we know the hardest and most expensive thing to do in the digital space is audience acquisition. And we really felt that we were limiting the impact of our investment by not providing the content people want when they get here and then not giving them ways to, to keep discovering. So we've really been thinking, what's the you know, ROI in this um, business decision? Um, you know, it's, it's not just this notion of getting content out, but really measurably improving connections. So um, I'm going to jump in here and say a few words about uh, why we decided to uh, build the, uh, the journal as part of our website and what benefits that's brought. So uh, I think many of you may be aware that the Art Institute has um, quite a few publications that were built with a customized version of the OSCE toolkit. Um, so you know, one of the questions that we had at the outset was, you know, why not adapt the ASCII toolkit to support this journal, uh, more periodical um, publication. And for us, you know, as an institution with a internal development team to support such projects, um, this, is, this, is, this is a question about ongoing maintenance, right? And about sustainability. Uh, the problem with the ASCII toolkit, at least the version that we have, is that it's built on a version of Drupal that is nearing its end of life, um, which is going to introduce all sorts of uh, security considerations uh, that will need to be addressed soon. So going into this project, we knew that this was coming, you know, com coming down the, uh, the pipeline. We, um, we had the choice to either upgrade the toolkit to a new version, which would be a huge undertaking, or explore alternate solutions. Um, so there are, uh, oh, and also uh, 2020 was a tough year, and we unfortunately lost a member of the publishing team who had the most experience with entering content um, and managing the ASCII toolkit. So between, between that situation and thinking about long-term sustainability, we had the choice of either uh, extending our website 
or bring a, a new platform into the fold. And uh, for the past maybe six years or so, um, the Art Institute has tried to push towards un a unification of technology wherever possible. Uh, so the idea of having less platforms to maintain uh, means that you'll be able to use the skills you have in more areas. Um, this was a big theme in our website redesign and in our choice of projects uh, since then, since 2017. Uh, so by integrating, uh, by integrating the journal into our website, we were able to make use of all the tools and effort that's gone into developing the website and uh, improving it since its launch. Uh, we already had a CMS and a front end ready to go. And by default, we were starting with a product that already complied with our brand. Um, so we didn't have to develop something new that would fit the brand. Instead, we would take this product and evolve it to have a more unique brand that suited the, uh, the needs of the journal. Uh, so think next slide, please. Okay, so in return, one of the benefits we got is that we, we're, we're investing all this effort into building out a journal platform for the website. Um, but then we can reuse this platform that we build for other publications um, that have different needs. So for example, since the uh, pandemic, we switched our member magazine to be uh, online only and We've had a lot of success with um, the new version, the new online version of the magazine. Um, but this switch would not have been as easy if we didn't have the journal as a basis to build off of. Um, we've also, uh, in parallel um, to developing the journal, we took the platform that we built out for the journal and we released a digital publication, a standalone catalog-like publication from it, um, which is available online today. You can go find it on our website, uh, Malgatana Mozambique Modern. Um, another thing to think about is the sort of drilling down to the nitty gritty uh, and the, like the, the components and the blocks that we build out for these publications. So with something like the journal, um, and Malangatana, we, we want to show, you know, interactivity, we want to show things that we not, might not be able to show in print. Um, and when we develop these features as part of our website, the rest of our website can make, can take advantage of it. We can use it in blog articles, we can use it in um, exhibition features. Um, there's just a lot of benefit in unifying uh, this effort into a single platform. Um, passing it on to And quickly, this collaboration really involved taking two teams at the Art Institute who are used to producing different types of content and making us work together. So as you can imagine, the publishing team has existing methods and schedules and processes for developing books and content. And our digital team has their methods and schedules. Um, and I wanted to, to mention just right off the bat that it came down to um, really trying to start off by learning each other's processes and doing the best we could to be super clear at the outset as to what we were building and what the steps were going to be that we were gonna go through because we couldn't anticipate that each team would understand different stages of production in the same way. So I have a beautiful um, engraving of a ship here, only to illustrate that when we started talking about galleys in publishing, which is the various rounds of, of designed book that you typically see, we're talking about something very different from what the digital team was talking about. Um, and our collaborators kept sending me pictures of ships every time I mentioned galleys. Uh, but the but in all seriousness, integrating the separate processes and schedules was a little bit tricky. We have real content at different stages of the process in, in experience design and in publishing. So understanding how we were going to design around fake content or real content was a really tricky 
piece and for the journal content wasn't ready until the very last moment i say pre-launch um and thus we really didn't have a real content to be designing with when we were developing the platform for us malingatana the digital publication um that launched this summer was actually a really useful dry run that we hadn't planned on uh, but it allowed us to see what it was like to have real footnotes and content and citation tools and things in action for the first time. And I'm not sure we would have made our launch on time for the journal if it weren't for that opportunity. Looking down the line at other, in, other uses of this content, we really have to navigate how brand identity and something like book or exhibition design is going to work. But we can talk about that a little bit later. And I just want to say, uh, because it's always good practice, that documenting all of our processes is something that we thought we were doing a good job at, but I would have done even more of if I could go back and do it again, especially through the last year with layoffs and furloughs. It was sometimes hard to track the process. So just a call out for documentation. So back on the Met side, um, our project uh, perspectives is really evolving on two fronts. Uh, the platform and the system and the editorial program with many parallel tracks which are represented by the blocks here in the diagram. Uh, the platform is a system that undergirds the user experience through categorization and the presentation of our content, obviously. The editorial program seeks to improve upon the strengths of our blogging program by being more inclusive and drawing on ideas and themes that are relevant to our audiences. Uh, the team also worked hard to decentralize the content management of many pages of the website, mostly the department pages, um, in order to distribute the workload and give staff an area to publish content relevant to their professional audiences, kind of hearkening back to what Sophie was talking about with our three archetypes. Um, these two fronts are not as distinct as this slide represents. The editorial program in, informs the system and vice versa, which is why we've been developing both at the same time. Um, our product development team is fully agile, so naturally we're taking a very iterative approach as we work to make the system and the program more robust. Um, we launched Perspectives as an MVP, a minimum viable product, by migrating two years of previous blog content and employing a system of verticals and streams to organize it. So like AIC, using previously published content in order to help build the system. As we iterate on the MVP, we will eventually provide tertiary tags as part of the taxonomy, which is not represented in this model. The fleshing out of this framework was performed by a large cross-departmental working group, which included colleagues in curatorial, conservation, education, external affairs, the list goes on. Here's a shout out to remote work. Uh, the convening of this large group of colleagues would never have been possible in person. We met regularly as a full group. We had great attendance and part active participation at all levels in these workshops, including an awesome design thinking exercise we called brainwalking uh, to come up with a huge list of audience focused themes. Any single piece of content in this system can appear in more than one vertical. Every piece of content is organized into several streams. So for example, an article on art, protest, and public space appears in the art and history uh, vertical, as well as the happenings and news vertical, and is tagged with social change, uh, public space, and on view. Uh, our content includes articles, videos, and soon to launch audio formats and includes newly published content as we move forward, as well as previously published content from blogs and microsites, which are being migrated uh, and attached to monthly themes that are promoted on the homepage and in newsletters. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Will Fenstermaker. I'm an editor and producer at the Met, and my pronouns are he, him, his. And the editorial half of this could really be the subject of a whole other, um, you know, hour-long presentation. So I'm going to go very, very, very quickly through it. And if people have questions, I'm happy to kind of talk more about it at the end. But suffice to say that, you know, as as this, you know, former blog program where people were asked to be, excuse me, asked to basically contribute as much as they felt capable of contributing at any point in time was condensed down into this more editorialized and streamlined, uh, you know, ecosystem. Um, 
that editorial body now responsible for overseeing the content had to come up with a system to help people actually manage uh, their input into that to be able to kind of see how you know their work in the museum related to what the publication was actually producing um, and helping them kind of come up with a system to uh, uh, rethink the work in the museum along the audience types that uh, perspectives had helped define and also the vehicles that we would actually be producing within. So the way that we came up with doing that was a monthly uh, thematic program. So essentially the editorial team comes up with uh, themes that are um, you know, collecting activities both within the museum and within culture more broadly. So it's kind of meeting the museum's activities with the zeitgeist and then hosting a series of, of um, open houses and other meetings across the museum where people can come and actually become aware of what uh, Perspectives is producing at any point in time and how they can start thinking about how their programming fits within that. Um, and so we're working about three to six months out on that. And as you kind of look further down the calendar, things get a little bit more ambiguous, but that's good because that helps us to actually um, you know, uh, redirect the engine towards what uh, the museum is actually producing at any given time. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, and the other aspect of that was actually winnowing down the forms of what are being produced. Um, you know, the, another kind of side effect of the blogging program is that there wasn't a lot of cohesion between, you know, whether something was an interview, why someone was being interviewed, uh, what our rules were around conducting interviews. And so we went through a process of, of, of actually standardizing uh, the article lengths, uh, word counts, image counts, all based on what we knew about how people were interacting with our content, what their drop off rates were, what they tended to be interested in, how long we can maintain their interest. Um, and carried that through into our, our interviews and uh, other formats as well. Um, next slide, please. And so while the articles and interviews kind of formed the basis of what we're publishing, once we had that ironed out, that allowed us to experiment with different kinds of forms. So we launched um, a form, uh, you know, a, a kind of interview form that we've been calling Roundtable, but more excitingly was this close look feature that we piloted in, in February. And, and this is, um, you know, a new feature that fits within the Perspectives ecosystem. It's built along the same tech stack, um, but um, because it comes out of that editorial programming, it allows people to actually, um, you know, essentially pitch and propose articles based on their programming. And uh, we can control the content that's coming through that pipeline a little bit more efficiently. Um, and I'll drop a link to one of those in the chat um, because it, I think it, that one's really exciting to kind of look at on your own time when you have a moment. Um, and that's it for me. I know that was really quick, but we can. Um, I'm Madhav Danka, product designer at The Match, uh, worked on Perspectives. As Will referenced, we have uh, on the design side a collection of templates that we've created, and uh, we're in a constant process of improving and expanding on them for Perspectives. These templates are built using the design system that the product design team has created over the years. And so the uh, elements used across the templates have not only internal consistency, but are also aligned with the look and feel of the site. Uh, we also do usability testing to make sure that uh, information is clear and digestible uh, and that people have clear pathways. Creating meaningful pathways and connections between our content is a major area of attention, as we've mentioned earlier. And we are in a constant process of dialogue with our colleagues who are writing the content about what building blocks we might need next, uh, which ones are working well or not working, if the ideal way to author things in the CMS has implications for the design, those kinds of things. So it is a balance, keeping an efficient and non-overwhelming number of building blocks while allowing for the flexibility that both the writers of the content as well as the readers of the website need so that the art and the narratives are presented in the way that they need to be. Uh, next slide, please. We, we didn't start from complete ground zero, tempting though it may be from a design and tech perspective. We started with an audit of all the wonderful varieties of experience that have been built up over the years in the past, because there's a lot of great stuff there. Um, innovative ways of looking at art, and sculpture and 3D, sound in relation to art, uh, documents, conservation stories, chronological narratives, uh, stuff that we don't have on the main website. Uh, so we use the most frequent and most important ones as starting points, but we constantly go back to past projects in order to bring work that's been done in the past into a more sustainable present. 
And we're also experimenting with potential new narrative techniques uh, at all times, again, in dialogue with our editorial colleagues. And even here, using content made in the past is a good way to guess at least partly whether a format can truly bring to life a story in a compelling way or not. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll pass it off to my AIC colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. So looking into the future, you know, the, our journal is really based on the premise that the, the museum is a place that can act for a forum for conversations about museums, conservation, art, and all of the various topics that we touch upon in our work all the time. So the creation of this journal is really something very new for us because it's not based solely on our collection, but it's based on the, the premise that we have, um, we have a role to play in the creation of this ongoing scholarly conversation and um, the production of knowledge around these various topics. So a lot of people aren't looking to find this exactly where we're putting it. So as we think about launch, we're thinking about ways that we can index and um, make this, this content findable. We have a wonderful board who in and they represent all sorts of, of um, industries and people who, who intersect with the museum and its work. But we're also, uh, for the first time, actually associating DOIs and an ISSN to all of our content in, am I still here? Hello? Yes, you're here. She was. <laughs> Lauren, now you're muted. Hello. <laughs> um, so we're assigning DOIs and ISSNs to all of our content and we're working through crossref.org in order to try and track citations. Uh, and I'm also currently looking into getting us into the following directories, JSTOR open access journals, the directory of open access journals and the digital art history directory. And as we look into our analytics and keep an eye on the project going forward, um, I look forward to sharing other, other um, tips and things that we find. So our future issues, just to let all of you know, and so that you can keep an eye on this particular project, issue number two is data, which will be super interesting from a development standpoint because we have scholars who are looking to incorporate data sets and visualizations into their work on museums um and art and art history and conservation issue number three is called in situ and issue four is love so we look forward to sharing those with you as they come along and i'll hand it over to Ilya to talk about the way this is impacting future development oh yeah uh lauren already hit on some of the big themes but the idea is like when you have content like this that doesn't relate directly to your collections how do you surface it when people do view your collections, which we know to be a big entry point into our site. Um, part of part of the, how we're trying to think about it is uh, maybe improving our taxonomies uh, and figuring out ways that are uh, the create overlaps between our website taxonomies and our collection taxonomies. Um, so surfacing surfacing content based taxonomies. Uh, another issue that we've had is. Um, how to show search results on our website of very long form content that we're getting increasingly um, more of with these digital platforms. Uh, that's still an open question for us, but we're looking forward to solving these from a technical and UX standpoint. So um, for future plans, I'll run through this really fast since we're running out of time. Um, we recently conducted a one question survey on perspective with, which asked users, what is the biggest impact of your online visit today? Um, the responses were not necessarily meant to align with our audience archetypes, the casual browser, the art enthusiast, the art professional, but the results did end up validating our framework in some ways. Um, plus, we gained valuable insights into the behaviors and motivations of our per perspective audiences. 
For instance, those seeking inspiration come via organic search. They are mostly on mobile devices and they are the highest proportion of new visitors. These are our casual browsers. Our art enthusiasts comprise the three tier col teal colored um, pie slices. They are mostly on mobile devices. They are the highest proportion um, of people coming from our email newsletters and uh, they are looking to learn something new by and large. Our art professionals um, are desktop users. Uh, they are 45% international and the percentage of returning visitors to the Met's website is higher. Most of these users are coming via organic search. So we will use these findings to hone our editorial, our content and our communication strategies, including a site-wide universal tagging project leveraging our online collection traffic and our upcoming guest editor program, which I'll throw to Will to talk about very quickly. Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Yeah, the guest editor program is something that we're conceiving of as a, as a biannual issue where we're inviting um, uh, people from essentially outside of the museum world to curate uh, uh, small issues um, out of our collection. So, you know what you see here is an example issue uh imagining hilton all's commissioning a section on uh queer portraiture in the met collection featuring poems by ocean vuong works by Zanel maholi uh an interview with louis fortino and then a roundup of of works of art from the met collection and the idea here is really to um you know get back to the to the root of of perspectives as name and and to um open up the platform for uh, non-curators, non-scholars, and, and, and non-academics to uh, think critically about the Met's collection and its programming. So just bringing us home, I know we're almost at time. A few recommendations across both groups. Um, be brave, change can be hard, but and disrupting workflows and expectations can lead to pushback, but there is, um, you know, uh, importance in thinking about the why and bringing people along on their journey being able to articulate why you're doing what you're doing um, really thinking about decentering authority and considering the museum as a place that can truly encompass more types of stories and storytellers um, so thinking outside of the box we've also seen how important it was to have content in our archives during the pandemic this is a worthwhile investment the long tail of evergreen content allows you to build new types of publications that you might not even have imagined yet and thinking about parallel tracks of development. So with your system and your editorial guidelines and criteria, making sure you document along the way and sharing what you're doing with your colleagues. Again, back to the first point. And then for these institutions, for both of our, our large organizations, using the museum's website was an important starting point. Um, at our scale, it was ultimately the right decision for sustainability to be able to test and learn and for future iterations. And kind of, um, as you've heard in a number of ways, folding these publications into larger ecosystems. Uh, we've made you know, great content and these help us to create stronger foundations um, where our positions are now in a, in a position to, to uh, bring our content to, to greater audiences. Um, so right on the hour, um, we'll admit we thought until we started this that we had a, a full hour to talk to you all. So um, hopefully if you've got questions, we are allowed to stay on to um, hear those, but just also acknowledging um, the labor involved in these projects. There are a few of us on these um, panels from our organizations, but it's obviously much, much, much larger teams that are involved in uh, giving input, advice, counsel, or actually doing the work of getting these projects done. So just want to acknowledge that for both of our teams. And thank you all for listening. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you all so, so much. I know we're getting kicked off of this channel, but or this this um, particular uh, Zoom, but we're happy to answer some more questions in the Slack. So if you go over, um, we can answer them there. Thank you so much for attending. And we look forward to talking to you more about these projects and maybe see you in the wrap up.